All right, let's see here. I bet you we can find a movie for this episode that is equal parts absurd comedy and serious crime drama, that established its lead as a mainstay bad boy of Japanese cinema, and whose director influenced a number of Western filmmakers in the following generation. Today, we're talking about Youth of the Beast, a 1963 Yakuza film by the late great Seijun Suzuki, a man who we've covered numerous times now, and whom we will most definitely be revisiting in later episodes. We've covered some of his later works, but let's jump to perhaps the first major watershed moment in his body of work, and the film that is recognized contemporary... contemporary... Contem that is recognized today as the beginning of his golden age in filmmaking. Seijun Suzuki, born May 24, 1923, in Nihonbashi, Tokyo, failed the entrance exam to Tokyo University and was drafted into World War II before entering Kamakura Academy, where he would earn his degree in film. In 1948, Suzuki was hired by Shochiku, one of the major film studios at the time. Shochiku at the time was also home to film giants Yasujiro Ozu and Kenji Mizoguchi. According to Suzuki, when the other ADs would get drunk together, they would discuss the need to make films that challenge Ozu's. However, Suzuki said that he never overtly meant to do this. Unsatisfied with his opportunities at Shochiku, Suzuki left in 1954 for Nikatsu, much the same as Yuzo Kawashima who we mentioned just recently, the production house behind Bakumatsu Taioden. He directed 42 films in the following 13 years, before ultimately being fired by company president Kyusaku Hori. But that's a story for another day. Today's film was one of Suzuki's Yakuza efforts, showcasing the more violent aspects of his directorial style. He describes directing as a physical activity, saying that one doesn't just need knowledge or brains, but strength. In such a situation, the director cannot be the only strong one though. You also need a strong lead. And for Youth of the Beast, Suzuki was assigned to work with Joe Shishido. Said Suzuki of working in the studio system, quote, I didn't pick him to play main characters. I was assigned to his movies. End quote. Leading man Joe Shishido, another recent loss for the Japanese film industry, was brought in by Nikatsu from a talent search that saw the entry of some 8,000 participants and was eventually whittled down to less than two dozen. Initially, the studio saw him as a leading romantic man, though Shishido was against this image and his career seemed to stagnate in this genre. While he found some success in his comedic endeavors, Suzuki said Joe wanted to make action films and wanted them to be as physical as possible. Things changed for Joe when he underwent cosmetic surgery in 1957 to artificially increase the size of his cheekbones. This makeover affected his character in the way he had hoped, with Nikatsu now casting him in villainous and anti-hero roles, which is how he ended up working with Suzuki on several Yakuza pictures. Youth of the Beast marked the second of four times that Suzuki would work with Joe Shishido, the first being earlier in the same year with Detective Bureau 23, Go to Hell Bastards. This was only shortly after Nikatsu began to produce the Sun Tribe films discussed in the previous episode, which gave the studio a needed facelift of its own after several years of underwhelming box office performance. Toshio Masuda, a prominent Nikatsu director at the time who worked with Yujiro Ishihara, who you'll recognize as the rebel samurai from Bakumatsu Taioden and the poster child of the Sun Tribe films, said of the period that each production house had its own approach to the Yakuza film. He stated that Toei's iconic Yakuza films were primarily Ninkyo Ega, or chivalry films, a standard where the characters are caught between right and wrong. He went on to say that those who saw Toei films were interested in them as gangster films, while Nikatsu had the market cornered on explosive drama, thanks to their experience with the Sun Tribe lineup. Bear in mind that Kinji Fukasaku's seminal Battles Without Honor or Humanity series that later revolutionized the Yakuza genre and injected it with a calculated but gritty tension also hailed from the Toei tradition. Masada goes on to explain how Nikatsu action movies were different from foreign offerings, saying that the pragmatic focus on human drama and occasional outbursts of non-stylized violence came largely from inexperience on the filmmakers' parts. 
Other countries were producing the original slew of James Bond's films, and Hong Kong had recently seen the establishment of the Shaw Brothers Studio, which itself followed a nearly four-decade tradition of Chinese martial arts films. Meanwhile, Japan had no strong relationship with martial arts and cinema, a relationship that wouldn't really be seen until the 70s with series like Street Fighter, Sister Street Fighter, and Lone Wolf and Cub. What resulted in Suzuki's time then was less stylistic violence. Youth of the Beast is, all things considered, a flashy Yakuza flick with equal parts style and substance. Joe Shishido here plays a man named Joe, who grifts his way into the employ of a local Yakuza gang. Or two, actually. He moves around town, trying to discover the intentions of two rival gangs, while evading the police. As it turns out, Joe is a former detective who went too far on a specific case, leading to his arrest and some time in jail. All of this is due to one of his companions in the police force being killed, and Joe snooping around for answers. Now, given that Joe is once more free, He's back on the case, looking for answers in his own vigilante style. By the climax of the film, Joe has instigated an all-out assault between the two Yakuza gangs, which erupts in as ridiculous and fantastic a fashion as one might expect from Seijun Suzuki. Though by all appearances, Youth of the Beast is just a down-and-dirty Yakuza flick, we can actually glean a lot culturally from it. For example, love suicides, or double suicides, called Shinju in Japanese, which are touched upon in the film, have a long history in Japan and Japanese storytelling, particularly in puppet theater. Chikamatsu Monzaimon, a playwright working mostly in Joruri, a form of puppet theater, wrote extensively on the subject throughout the 1700s. This is likely because Monzaimon was working in the midst of the Edo period, a time in which the belief that lovers, whether married or not, would be reunited posthumously became widespread. Thus, when a romantic interest conflicted with their social environment, this belief provided the romantic notion that two lovers might be undisturbed by such naysayers in the afterlife. You can see in an earlier film, Bakumatsu Taioden, that the idea was heavily romanticized and popular in the Meiji era, with the book salesmen peddling mostly love suicide stories to unmarried geisha and prostitutes. The idea that these people could be eternally with someone is something worth dying for, though in the case of the woman who instigates a failed love suicide, it is only worth it if it's convenient. The more modern approach to love suicides seen in Youth of the Beast might be indicative of cultural attitudes of the time toward the changing roles of Japan with respect to itself and the world after World War II. Bakumatsu Taioden also included love suicides as a theme and was released six years prior to Youth of the Beast, which would seem to indicate that the practice of Shinju was still on at least some in the population's minds. Bakumatsu Taioden was released only five years after the American post-war occupation had ended, a time still marked with reconstruction. It called back to the Meiji era of a hundred years prior to examine how Japan might proceed into modern era. Youth of the Beast, however, was released more than a decade after American forces had officially left the country, and after the bloom of the economic miracle, which would see Japan experiencing unprecedented growth for nearly three decades. It's remarkable to note how the dress and general look of the Yakuza and everyday citizens of Tokyo has changed in this time period. Already, we are seeing a fierce westernization of the country's image. Suzuki's films were shot on notoriously low budgets, usually going from pre to post-production in a very short time, but more on this later. He didn't have the resources, it would seem, to put together extravagant wardrobes for his B-movies instead relying on what was easily available, in this case almost exclusively Americanized dress. The Japanese-ness of the film, then, is relegated to the mention of such cultural touchstones as love suicides, or the Yakuza themselves and how they organize their ranks. Another cultural touchstone along these lines is the repeated mention of tuberculosis. In both films, the disease is mentioned almost flippantly, offhanded, suggesting that the contemporary viewer would be fully aware of the implications of contracting tuberculosis. 
For the uninitiated, tuberculosis, or TB as it is often shortened in English, is a bacterial infection most often afflicting the lungs and causing a heavy cough not unlike the grifter of last episode. In times past, if one was said to have died of consumption, this meant that they had succumbed to TB. This is because among other symptoms like coughing up blood, chest pain, fatigue, fever, and more, TB can cause excessive weight loss and loss of appetite. Though a number of people do possess the disease unwittingly, it is most often latent and generally unharmful, with only 10% of those infected developing TB as a life-threatening illness. But why does this come up in two films released so close to one another? Following the Meiji Restoration, a number of measures were taken to modernize Japan. Instituting policies and programs to gather information and technology from outside of the country, and to use these means to propel Japan onto the world stage as a major player. With this, and Japan's Industrial Revolution, came the need for workers, who, similar to how they did in America and other industrialized nations, worked really long hours in really poor conditions. Thus, in the early 1900s, tuberculosis became a main cause of death among these workers. As a preventative measure, then, workers who developed the symptoms of TB were sent back to their homes outside of the cities, or were sent to live in the growing slums of the major cities where they had moved to work. This, of course, helped to spread the disease more quickly, as the flow of people increased between major population centers and the villages from which the workforce hailed. As the disease became more prevalent, and with an antibiotic effective against the disease not being discovered until 1944, the families of the infectious and those afflicted became shunned. Yet, despite this real-world shunning and the agony induced by TB, Japan, along with the English-speaking world, has a strong literary tradition of romanticism with respect to the disease, through positive depictions of sufferers in literature and art. This could partially explain why the characters of both films offhandedly comment that the protagonists may have TB. They are saying both that our heroes might have the disease because TB was so prevalent within the country that an average moviegoer would understand the reference, but also because we are supposed to detect the subtle romanticism attributed to both the funny, scheming grifter and the dark, brooding Joe. And in spite of how much a film like Youth of the Beast can tell us about the country from which it hails, if you were to ask Seijun Suzuki, he would tell you this was completely unintentional. Suzuki has explained that making films isn't exactly enjoyable since it's a job, not a hobby. He worked on the B-movies for Triple Bill shows, allowing him some freedom to experiment, but it is not as though he was given free reign over his projects, with scripts and stars being assigned to him rather than him being allowed to pick what interested him. In addition to the personnel demands of the studio, Suzuki had to contend with their intense production and release schedule. At the time, Nikatsu had a habit of releasing two films per week to their theaters. Thus, a typical schedule for a B-roll film like those Suzuki directed was 25 days for shooting and 3 days for editing and sound mixing. This is to what we were referring when we said that he likely couldn't cull extravagant wardrobes on his schedule, though he has stated that he seeks as a director to elicit character from his actors through extraordinary sets and costumes. Striking and dramatic, yet easy enough to procure on such a tight schedule. He said he was taught to shoot only the necessary shots, nothing excessive that might be cut, at Shochiku Studios, and that as a result, his films often require little to no editing beyond simply arranging them. Thus, post-production is very utilitarian on his projects. Seijun Suzuki said in an interview that he joined Nikatsu to help support himself, and that he learned filmmaking while at the studio. He said that he was a quote-unquote filmmaker without a passion. He began as a program director, producing non-artistic scripts at first. He tried a number of styles throughout his career, wanting to make something entertaining rather than focusing on a message or commentary. His style was frenetic, constantly changing with the varied assignments he was given, and always trying to catch the viewer's attention. He has no interest in showing a realistic sense of time and space, leading to perhaps a strange sense of continuity. His theory is that, as long as the narrative makes sense, that's all that's important. He states that his use of lighting and framing don't have any deeper meaning, but that they are used for effect, surprise, and excitement. 
to entertain once again. He didn't use lighting to portray visually a character's CD background, as we saw with Ryu Murakami in Tokyo Decadence. Instead, he used lighting to make things more dramatic and to cover up weaknesses in the frame. Despite having his scripts given to him, Suzuki said he has never made a film without making edits as director. He was a spontaneous director, saying that pre-calculated movies are not interesting, and that a director must be able to adapt to the weather or the actors. Instead of storyboarding, he would allow things to come up the day of or the day before his films were shot. He also intentionally avoided storyboards to help create a sense of magic in his shots. Suzuki said that it was not the Yakuza genre that interests him as much as the persona of the Yakuza, a character that lives close to death when compared to a normal person. Thus, someone whose time and place and method of death can be described. Recall how we mentioned earlier that each major studio had their own style of Yakuza film, especially before the release of Fukusaku's seminal 1970s series of films that forever changed the genre. These differences allowed Suzuki to direct his films in an exciting yet apolitical way, a way which tells us much about contemporary Japan, yet doesn't beat us over the heads with a message. While studios like Toei were producing Ninkyo Ega, the aforementioned, the aforementioned chivalry movies, Suzuki Anikatsu was more interested in the gritty type of film on display in Youth of the Beast. Ninkyo Ega were primarily interested in giri, or duty, and ninjo, or humanity. The struggle between being a humanitarian for the sake of your clan, and adhering to the rules of the clan, even at the downfall of personal relationships. The moral compass explored rather succinctly and regularly by Toei's Yakuza films pointed to a distinctly Japanese sensibility, in a time when the country was becoming more American, thanks to the recent occupation. These two themes came from the complex Giri Ninjo, considered a singular theme in the forerunner of Yakuza film, the Samurai film. Conversely, Nikatsu's Yakuza lineup, and particularly Suzuki's efforts by his own admission, were not politically charged. Free from the nationalism one could detect in the Toei Yakuza catalog, Suzuki and his Nikatsu counterparts often included technology, cars, locations, and characters with a western twinge to them. Not dissimilar to the relation one could draw between the Sun Tribe films and their contemporaries, the rebellious youth films of America starring James Dean and Marlon Brando. One would not be wrong to see similarities in Suzuki's Yakuza films and American action films like Dirty Harry of the 70s, as well as films of the French New Wave. This impact can be seen even further into the current time period, with Suzuki being a noted influence on Park Chan-wook, John Woo, Jim Jarmusch, Takashi Miike, and even Quentin Tarantino. If you could say nothing else, you could at the very least say Seijin Suzuki was a very distinct director, and for that reason, he is greatly missed. <laughs>